everybody, and welcome back to the 1313 Podcast, the most mediocre podcast in the Star Wars universe. And oh my gosh, it's Have a Chat. Woo! The show where we have a chat, where we bring on a guest and we have a chat. Today we are joined by none other than Hybrid Toy Reviews. Woo! <laughs> so, everybody, make sure before we get into this Have a Chat, we're just going to go down our laundry list real quick. Follow us on social media. We have Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Make sure to go join our Discord for cool Star Wars conversations with the community including Hybrid Toy Reviews, who's in the Discord. Uh, make sure to also consider supporting us on Patreon. We have some awesome, awesome benefits, including monthly giveaways. We have an awesome one coming for November. And also, if you want merch, we have merch in our merch store. Everything linked below in the description, along with links to all of Hybrid Toy Reviews stuff. So, with that being said, Hybrid Toy Reviews, tell us a little bit about yourself and your content. All right. Um, I started a few years back. I just like to review collectibles. You know, it kind of started as a Doctor Who channel because there weren't really many of those. Um, there was basically nothing to review. I learned that early on and I bought a lot of Star Wars stuff. So it kind of rapidly became that. And uh, so now I mostly just review Black Series figures. If I find something outside of Black Series I think is cool, I'll do a video. Sometimes I talk about conventions I go to and all sorts of nerdy stuff. So. Cool. About it. Yeah, so you're you're the first guest that appeared on our channel before you were a guest, actually. Right. Um, and that was your appearance in uh with us on our social media for um the Erie Comic Con mm -hmm. a couple months back. Which video I'm holding on to uh until November because it doesn't fit spooky season. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's not really the spooky vibes, but no, that was a good time though. We gotta mm -hmm get together again for stuff like that mm -hmm. yeah it was a good time so um I, I i guess my first question is um what disease do you have because i see a lot of funko pops behind you and you know how we feel at 1313 about funko pops generally so, yeah yeah so it, that kind of ties into the doctor who stuff there's a lot of funko pop mm -hmm. and all of them are doctor who ones there's okay. basically very little merch outside of it um, and they don't even make them anymore, but I have a complete set. Um, some, you know, I mean, most pops, you know, I don't really care about a couple of them are kind of high value ones. So I don't know. They're, uh, they're I don't know. Just, uh, they're, they're not in the main display room. You know, this, my kind of office bedroom space is sort of overflow. So it's not cool enough to be okay. with the actual figures. Okay. Right. If I see, uh, one more TikTok clip of Doctor Who taking Van Gogh to the Van Gogh Museum. I'm going to blow my head off. <laughs> From my favorite episode, but they do post it a lot. So. I, I like literally like once a week, I'll see it on TikTok. <laughs> Me too. I'll be like, no! <laughs> yeah, it's a good episode, but it just gets shared way too much. Like there's a lot of other good stuff outside of it, but. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's stuff like that with every like show though, or movie franchise. There's always that one scene that everybody talks about. Right. And it just as if you're like an actual fan of the franchise or the series, even if that's your favorite scene, I like you almost cringe when people talk about it because it's like the only thing anybody knows mm -hmm. about the right. series. I cringed because some guy got casted as Van Gogh. <laughs> that wasn't William Defoe. Right. Yeah, I mean it wasn't even accurate. He had two ears and everything. I mean yeah, they didn't do a good job on it. Wasn't even yeah, I mean, it was, it was a good episode, but I mean, like everyone always like goes to that one and I'm like, Hey, I mean, I like it, but what about like all these other good ones where, I mean, the show's been on for 50 years and the reboots like 14 seasons in. And I'm like, we're, we're only talking about this one. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bit yeah. Of a That's kind of how I feel about like empire. Honestly, I feel like, yes, yeah. empire is a fantastic star Wars film, but anytime you talk about star Wars and, and you know what I'm talking about, people will go, Luke, I am your father. And I'm just like, please make it stop. It's like, make oh my it gosh, stop so right indubiously now. funny. <laughs> right. When someone comes up and says, hey, Empire's my favorite movie. And you're like, wow, what a unique and original take. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I'm starting to feel about Revenge of the Sith now, too, though. Like, oh, yeah. especially if you're like a very surface level fan, you know? Right. I think I'm totally gatekeeping age. right now, and I have no problem doing that. Right. It's okay. Yeah. You know, sometimes. And I think if you're our age, Revenge of the Sith is your favorite. Yeah. Right. No. And I mean, it's, you know, it, it's kind of weird. You know, people are doing to the sequels right now mm -hmm. what the original fans did to the prequels forever. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, everyone grew up on those old three and then the prequels came out and they're 
like hardcore knocking on them, but now it's kind of cool. You know, there's this resurgence where a lot of people are kind of proud to say, Hey, one of the prequels is my favorite. And right. It'll be neat to see, you know, where people are at in, you know, 10, 15 years, you know, there's going to be some kids that genuinely say, Hey, I saw, you know, force awakens last Skywalker, what a or rise of Skywalker in theaters as a kid. And that was my favorite movie I went to. <laughs> They're just not old enough to be the loud voices yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that we've been we've been saying that for like eons now. It's we one of our themes. We uh we think right. it's just kind of a generational thing, and it at the end of the day, these are movies and stuff made for kids. Except for Andor, I I wouldn't no. show Andor to a kid. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. There there's some stuff there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How are you enjoying Andor? How are you liking it so far? I have a a take on it. Oh, let's hear the take. Most most are going to think of it as a hot one. Oh, okay. I'm I'm not disliking what's happening, but I'm disliking the weekly format for Andor. Okay. Yeah. Um, because like it feels like we're constantly building up. And so, like, you wait a week for an episode, and then that episode is just further build up for what you know is coming. You know, we had two episodes of Cassian and these rebels basically just saying, we don't know each other, so we don't like each other. And, like, it could have been one, or I, I wish I didn't have to wait a week for the second half of it. Hmm. Um, I haven't seen this most recent episode yet. I've, I've heard that, you know, the stuff finally goes down. But uh, I, I've kind of... Just not, I don't want to say dude, wanted to, dude. but just haven't gone for it yet. Dude, how have you not seen <clears throat> the mid season finale? How? Right. No, and I mean, and I've heard it's great, but I'm just, I, I, just, I just haven't, you know, I, I thought about, you know, watching it tonight before we talked, you know, that way I wouldn't have to say I haven't seen it yet and get bullied by you guys. <laughs> but uh, like, I, I, I mean, I, I think Andor with it being a lot of buildup for a fi- finally the episode comes or something happens. I almost think it lends itself more to binging yes. that weekly episodic format. Mm-hmm. And a part of me wants to just stay with it. So I'm not behind, but another part of me is like, I'd probably personally enjoy it more if I just waited for it to be over and then spend a day watching the whole thing. See, that's, that's an interesting take. So I actually um, shout out to Sarlacc digest podcast. I've been following along every week with their, weekly and or episodes. Um, and they brought up that question in last week's episode, especially after seeing this mid season finale, as we're calling it, right. the question of is Andor more of a bingeable show than a weekly release show. And I think that at first we were all very confused with Andor why it got delayed three weeks from the beginning of September to September 21st. And then they released the first three episodes together. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, I think that it wasn't because, you know, Disney or Lucasfilm was pushing it back. I think they did it because early audiences watched the show and said that putting the first three together is going to bring more people into the show than just that first episode alone. I mean, deeply, you know, rooted star Wars fans who want to know things like, Oh, what, what does cup of noodle look like in star Wars or, you know, like stuff, little stupid things like that. We eat that up, but the, your general star Wars fans who have come into the franchise with Disney plus and the Mandalorian and, and Obi-Wan Kenobi and all these other shows, they're going to say it's too slow, you know, and the other shows are a lot more fast paced. They work as like a, a Western serial where you can get one episode a week and be content with it. But I feel like for newer fans and or isn't that for me and or leaves me wanting to see more more than any other star wars show has i would say to this point yeah just because it's a little bit more difficult to predict where each episode is going to go and how things are going to happen i like the slow pacing of it because um that's another reason why i'm such a big fan of the batman the movie that came out at the beginning of this year it's because i like that it takes its time that it's slow because i feel like everything nowadays is so fast paced and there's just like we got a story. We need to get it like in two hours because that's what audiences want to see because, well, we can't drag it out. And it's just so much longer because people don't want to see that. I, um, I don't know. I like my stuff long formatted if it needs to be. And with Andor, even though these episodes are, they're like an hour long, pretty much each episode and not a lot happens in them, but they don't drag like at all. Like they're still like, they're jam packed with like little things that like, Mm, tickle my star wars brain like they mentioned like planets like that are like super obscure that have been in like in one thing and kind of binds the galaxy together a little bit better 
Right. And I mean, like I, I, I've li- like you say, I, I have liked how there's been a lot of deep cut references, but there's been a lot of episodes where the episode, you know, wraps and the credits start. And, and, and I just sit back and I think about what I've just watched. And I'm like, wow, like not a ton actually happened. You know, mm-hmm. it was a bit of build up. And I mean, like those first three episodes, like we were saying, you know, they were great that day that the first three episodes dropped you know i mean i i felt like i watched something you know there was a a lot of build up you know but you did get that conclusion of you know cassian has now met a a rebel guy and he's gonna start you know doing his you know rebel life that we know that he had by the time of rogue one but you know then like those like the episodes four and five came and you know like four you know it's like okay it's building up to this you know they're they're gonna go and do his first rebel imperial raid you know and so I'm like, all right, I, I'm kind of liking this. But then the second episode, you know, episode five is just like, okay, well, we uh, we had a rocky beginning last week with each other, and uh, we're we're still rocky. But you know, and, and then it just concludes with them at the doors of the base, basically. And I, I think it was mostly that episode where I was like, wow, I'm kind of getting tired of so little happening. Like, like you know, I'm I'm okay with being slow, and the references were good, but mm-hmm. like. And I mean, I, I watched that one and I was like, wow, I have to like wait another week to finally see how this is going to, how this mm-hmm. is going to go. The one thing I think that's really pulling me out of the show though, is the fact that um they they didn't do too well at de-aging Diego Luna to actually make him look like he was six years old. He looks a lot older. Yeah. You know, I, I thought he was in this fight since, since he, he was, was six years old. old. Right. Yeah. 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 I've never seen a six-year-old with a beard before, so it's just <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's just pulling me out a little bit, right? And, and I mean, like, you know, I, I really thought we were also going to get to see a, a fair amount more of his childhood. You know, they made a a, a big deal with those first three episodes with their flashbacks, and mm-hmm. like, and so my implication because, like, I thought I'd read somewhere they haven't really said it yet that like he was raised as a separatist or something during the clone wars era or like no. the end of it no I then mean, i i might no, be so just... this is what i get this is the other thing i really like about the show and we've mentioned it several times on the podcast that it the show not leaves things up to interpretation but it doesn't ex- like overtly express to you what the character was doing at this time in their life your things are they're there they exist and the right. details are there for the viewer to find and understand um i've called it star wars for smart people is what i call andor and if you don't like it guess what that makes you star wars for dumb stupid people. so no so i'm just kidding so right. um the thing about cassian is if you notice in those flashback scenes in the first couple episodes um on canary um mm-hmm. is the name of the planet uh there are no adults in the village it's all children right. Um, and that is because we, I mean, we've come to the conclusion that all the adults are dead from the mining disaster. Mm-hmm. Um, so Cassian gets picked up by, by his adopted mother and father. Um, right. And then actually, you know, they mentioned the father died, but the blaster pistol that Cassian uses was his father's. Right. Yeah. Um, I saw, I saw where they were talking about. Yeah. That. Very nice detail there. And again, it's, they say Republic in the show, but those technicians were separatists. And I think that, I think that we're only going to see more of that as the timeline progresses. Now, what I think is also going to happen is either this episode or next episode, we're going to see those, those clone troopers because I think, well, I'm not going to talk any more about the future of the show because you need to watch that last episode because you will, I guarantee, I I know for a fact, you're going to feel like those last two episodes paid off and everything that you went through in the last two episodes were worth it. And they come back in this next episode. When Andor and Cyril start making out in this episode, you're you're just going to love it. Right. Yeah, For real. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like I haven't been disliking it, but you know, I mean, I guess that's ultimately my take is I think it's more of a, more of a binge show. I I think when the show is finally done, because I'm going to stick with it weekly. I think when it's done, I'm going to take a day and just, rewatch the entire thing and uh you know just sit down and you know just do nothing but you know recap yeah. mm-hmm. here's the question though <laughs> uh do you prefer to binge shows or you or do you prefer the weekly uh kind of up uploads i guess of, I mean, uh, of shows i mean I, I go either way on it i mean some shows you know i I, I usually have trouble sitting down for like an entire season, you know, usually, but I, I want to sit down and watch like two, three, four episodes. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, something like the Mandalorian or Kenobi, you know, it was weekly, you know, but it was very jump in and, you know, it was very just watch the big, you know, fights, you know, every week kind of yeah. thing, very episodic. And, uh, it wasn't necessarily always building. And so like those, like, yeah, by the end of the episode, you feel like the episode is usually concluded. Um, whereas Andor is usually very open-ended because, you know, Hey, you know, we're next week is going to pick up right where this was. So like with Andor, I, I, I have a bit of impatience almost because like, well, we're at the door of the base. Now I want to see them go into the base, you know, let's, you know, let's get to it. So I think, cause like they seem to be doing Andor and like, pairs of three episodes so far yeah. and i think the next episode seven is going to be its own thing i thought i'd seen they were saying but the like, next chapter of the story right and I'm, I'm thinking like Andor. i would at least want to watch it like three at a time you know get the yeah you know get the beginning to the end of the mission and then whatever format they do from there mm-hmm. yeah um so i'm just uh gonna be tic tacking away on the laptop but i did have a question for you as well how do you feel about the very common opinion now on the internet that if something not that's not momentous to the plot or doesn't directly dramatically affect the plot in an episode that the episode is now filler what's your what's your take on all that it's ridiculous they wouldn't have written it if there wasn't some purpose and i I think the best most easy to explain example would be star wars rebels there were so many episodes during the airing that people are like oh this is ridiculous this is filler what are these stupid space whales and yeah they didn't talk about them again for two years but they did end up being relevant right you know i i think anything that's filler only seems like filler because you don't know what they're going to do with it yet yeah that's kind of i've always gotten kind of frustrated with the whole filler argument because what happens to character building you know it's like uh, at what point do we stop with character building do you just want to do away with it altogether and then you just have stuff that goes on that just you know you don't know anything about the characters anymore now you have a show that that just happens and the characters just exist and that's kind of how i felt with obi-wan kenobi i know i'm kind of beating a dead horse when i say that at this point because you know but I, i feel like we had all these rebel characters like Roken and the pilots. And, you know, you know, we made a joke about Wade when she's like crying and crying about the one snow speeder pilot Wade Mm -hmm. because he dies of the Inquisitorious. I never cared. I've rewatched the show three times, dude. I still don't care, but I watch Andor and I've watched the sixth episode three times. And I care more about those characters because they took the time Mm -hmm. to build them up Mm -hmm. and write them. That was one thing about Obi Wan is I I think it should have been a movie. It really should have been a movie. Um, uh, I feel like most of the problems with Kenobi span from the fact that they wrote it as a movie and then they said let's make it a TV series. Yep. And then there's not like filler episodes, but there's filler content within itself like shots that don't need to exist of people like running from like the running like uh in the inquisitorious when obi-wan like breaks over the window and there's the water wall or whatever right there's like three shots of him running from the water when you really could only you should have boiled it down to like maybe two i think there's like actually four shots of it it's like it's a little like overbearing so right no and i I, i'm with that um, to back a little bit to the to the character building argument, like going into a show like Kenobi, we've spent a lot of time with Vader. We've spent a lot of time with Obi-Wan. Yeah. And while they are in different places than we've seen them before, we've never seen them in the middle of that 20 year gap. Knowing right. the characters as well as we do, we can pretty reasonably guess that Obi-Wan's a bit traumatized and Vader's angry. And mm-hmm. You know, some character building is required with them. But considering that the show is so heavy on characters that we already know a lot about, they really should have spent a lot more time worrying about the new ones. It seemed like they spent more time on Reva than anyone else. But Reva was not the only, you know, and and even then, you know, Reva wasn't super fleshed out. You know, she just got more than the others did. Yeah. And that's, I wonder, it makes me wonder where we're going to see these characters next. You know, we have all these characters that we've now established in these new shows 
and they come and go and you feel like there's going to be more to their story. And I wonder if this is just like a, is Lucasfilm just putting them in the back pocket to pop up later if they need something? Or yeah. is this a plan? Is this like Marvel where it's like there's a plan for every character that pops in for a, a post credit scene or, you know, something or other that these characters are bound to pop up again. Right. Yeah, no. And I mean, it could, could very well be something like that. I mean, they're, they've established so many and there's not really any great place for a lot of them to go outside mm -hmm. of Andor. We don't really have any projects like in that between three and four, you know, going on our, our next yeah. thing is, um, you know, Mandalorian season three, the Ahsoka show. And uh, you know, they're doing a lot in that era. So, you know, at that point, in the timeline, we're like 15, 20 years after Kenobi and Andor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, what's Reva been doing for the last 20 years? Is she still around? You know, Rowan, you know, I mean, like where, where have they been? What have they done? There's so much time that anything could have happened and there's not really a great place to put them unless we say something years down the road, but also, mm -hmm. you know, like Rowan didn't get any character building. So am I going to care when he shows up? Or is it just going to be a, Hey, there's that guy. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. And, It'll oh, just kind of be. Amazing. Haja will come back. Will Haja come back? That's the question. Haja. What's how, the bounty on me now? How long will it be until we see him again? One year, two years. <laughs> I love Haja. Yeah, I I liked him too. He was one of my favorite, you know, just side characters. I silly goofy odd guy. <laughs> right. So hey, so I wanted to switch gears here. Um, so uh, you know, we're talking about. Andor and stuff and you know in the trailers there were the clone troopers uh, mm -hmm. in the trailers for Andor we see m a ton of phase one or phase two live action clone troopers um, it was awesome to see the clone troopers in Obi-Wan Kenobi the 501st you know not CG for the first time mm -hmm. um, and now we had a reveal from Hasbro today and I'm actually going to do something really cool where I Jacob's going to do it because I'm just literally socially inept when it comes mm -hmm. to or technologically inept but yeah, right. so can you see it? Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So here we had Hadsbro's revealing of the Black Series clone trooper helmet. Um, we're super excited about this. We're over the moon. We think it's super cool. So, uh, but the one thing about it is, is that we think it looks a little bit goofy. So, um, uh, Tommy, did you want to elaborate on the goofiness? Actually, let me grab a... Um, well... Let me grab... So these are one of the helmets that we've made here. I think these actually look better. So this is a right. a, a helmet that is accurate to mm -hmm. um, Revenge, of the, Revenge of the Sith. And this is from the files uh, from Galactic Armory. So that's that's what this looks like. They Let me see if I can get it the same position. And, uh, yeah, right there. Yeah, so uh, the differences that I can clearly see um, is uh, one with the the, the visor, the visors look a tad different. Right. Uh, I don't know. I think the visor looks a little bit more animated style than the uh, Revenge of the Sith one. But then Tommy found or saw something and pointed out that um, actually the helmet looks to be uh, like it's from Jedi Fallen Order. So, yeah. So shout out to, I think it was Floral Fly Solo guy or whatever his name is. Let's see. I haven't. Yeah, Floral Fly Solo Guy on Instagram. He, I was commenting back and forth on Yak Face posts with some people, and he um, commented saying, I think it looks like the way the visor is, because that was the thing that was off-putting to me when I first saw the helmet the most. For me, I think it's the fact that the brow is, like, it doesn't have any, like, protrusion, protrusion at all, and it looks really small. Yeah, but if you look at the clone troopers from Jedi Fallen Order, it looks much closer, especially this little... Uh, this cut here in the, in the corner of the T visor, it's much more akin to what we see with this Hasbro clone trooper helmet. So, I mean, what are your thoughts? Do you like it? Do you not like it? What are we thinking on it? I mean, I, I like it. I, a lot of people have been saying it looks a little too animated. Something to note is that it is being labeled under the clone Wars subline for black. Series yes. Mm -hmm. In that yellow stripe. Um, yeah, that's an argument that can, that has been used for any differences in the Clone Wars era clone troopers that they've put in the line, you know, why the 332nd black series didn't have a black stripe because it didn't have it in the Clone Wars. Um, so some style, if some style differences, you know, you, you could at least say, you know, while it may be a flaw in Hasbro's design, you can at least say, but it's Clone Wars labeled and get away with it. Uh, the one thing 
and it's kind of looking better on the side pictures on the box, but on the main picture, just looking at the helmet, the one thing that's really kind of caught my eye is it just looks like it has a giant forehead. Like the eyes are like way low from like, yeah, I, I guess not extremely, but it's like, also sitting at an angle. You have to, you have to remember that. Right. Right. But I mean, it just, I mean like that picture right there, you know, kind of looking at it from the side, it just seems like there's a lot of distance between the black stripe and where the, you know, the middle of the head ridge is. Yeah. That's why I thought that the stripe should have been like, maybe like up to here. Like it looks like way too thin. And then right. I'm also a little bit confused at the fact that there's like zero definition between let's see if they have like a side view. Well, this kind of works. There's like not a whole ton of like definition between the the top of the of this brow and then the rest of the helmet and then there's also not a lot of definition between this gray part and the rest of the helmet and right. um you can see on this one there's a lot there's there's a little there's a a good amount of little divot here i'd say like maybe like a, not like a sixth an eighth of an inch maybe right um, it's really not a lot, but it's not. Um, so i don't know i I'm glad that this helmet exists now because it makes uh, collecting clone trooper helmets a lot easier to access to a lot of people. Cause one, not everybody has the artistic ability to go out and create their own helmet. Like when it comes right. to painting, you can just buy the kits for cheap, but not everybody has the time or the ability to do it. And then not everybody has the money to go out and spend $500 on a finished a, one. A finished one. So at the right. end of the day, uh, although I personally think it looks a little weird, it doesn't matter to me because I can go off and I can make my own helmets if I wanted to, and I can make them any any way I want, whether it's accurate or not, and tune it to how I think looks best. But this just makes it easier to access to all collectors who are a fan of the Clone Wars. I talked to there's this girl in my uh, in my Design Two class today. Um, who is in love with a bad batch and she likes waxer a lot. She has oh, a little cool. uh, three inch clone wars figure that she painted to look like waxer. Oh, sweet. And uh, she intends on buying the helmet to put, make it look like waxer's helmet. So for people like that, it's absolutely perfect because this makes it easier for them to access the ability to get these helmets and customize them themselves. It's only like one thirty, which I thought, I thought that one was going to be like 200 bucks. Hasbro is Yakface said today that Hasbro is going to probably list it at $132, which I think is actually like a really fair price. Like for what it is, I think that's an amazing And price. it comes with a voice changer. That is now, cool too. Now, I wonder, I think it's probably going to be D. Bradley Baker's voice because it's listed as a Clone Wars item. I think um, it's going to be like one of the, the Kylo Ren voice modulator. Like, here. Don't mind my epic pants. Of everything that they've announced on it, honestly, the voice changer is probably what impresses me the least, just because I've heard like, really? the, the Stormtrooper voice changer. It's yeah, not going to sound... So, like, you can't even say anything. People thought, I'm Kylo Ren. The Stormtrooper helmet, at least the only one that I ever got my hands on, was very similar to that where it didn't sound like that kind of stormtrooper voice that, you know, you would hear in rogue one or rebels mm -hmm. or anything. It was just, it just kind of randomly like garbled your voice, you know, not to any specific tone. If you wanted it to sound like that, you kind of had to like mess with your pitch a little bit. And I mean, I, I, I don't think there's really any great voice modulator where it's just like, I'm going to talk like this and D Bradley break Baker is going to come out. Right. Um, and honestly, for the black series helmets outside of like light effects, like the little red dot on the Boba helmet. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I I'd rather them just cut the voice changers and then like knock down the cost. I mean, one thirty is not bad, but if it could be like one ten, cause there's no electronics and it is just a bucket like that. Cause like, I'm not going to put batteries in it. If I get it, you know, I'm not even going to, I mean, I, I'll put in batteries to like hear how bad it sounds. Then I'm going to take the batteries out and then not, <laughs> Not I like, ever. I like the fact that there is the tech already included in it because there's highways then for wiring and kits. So when people get their hands on it and they want to mod it, I saw some, that somebody took the electronics in this and they gutted it and they replaced it with like an actual speaker. And it sounded like literally exactly like Kylo Ren, like the, the modulator that he used. And it was connected to a speaker that he would hook on his chest and it would be covered by his costume. 
-hmm. and it was 501st approved. So I feel like it's good because one, it's intro level. It's like a gimmick for people that are just getting it just to get it. And they're like, oh, this is kind of cool. But right. then if you want to go above and beyond, you have the ability to strip it and then you have the pathways to rewire it yourself if you want to. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, and, and that's good too. I mean, for that sort of cosplay application, I do agree. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing we were talking about are accuracy arguments, you know? Yes. Yeah. I mean, with a lot of these black series helmets and the lightsabers and your prop replicas, th they're all good, but if you want the most, you know, they have to make tweaks to them to make them functional as a mass produced item. Um, you know, if you want the most accurate, the most perfect, looks like it just came off the screen, you're already in a niche, you know, you're, you know, some people are just going to see that clone trooper helmet and be like, that is obviously a clone trooper and it's a really good looking helmet. But if you're someone where, you know, the, the size of the brow or the gray ridge is really, really going to bother you. I mean, like you're already used to spending the, you know, the, the bigger dollar for the mm -hmm. higher function replicas. One of the things, and it's bugged me on these since like I was a kid is, um, like a lot of Hasbro's lightsabers, you know, this is like the original, you know, force effects, Luke, you know, Luke and Obi-Wan's, you know, has a very thin area up here, you know, mm -hmm. the, the hilt tapers down to very little and then widens back up for the emitter. And they could never do that for a toy. I mean, the plastic ones that collapse in, you know, mm -hmm. the blade will never go in. And for these, the first time that someone tries to hit it, you're going to bend there. And, so, like, if you really want that perfect Luke Skywalker or Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, lightsaber replica, you're going to go to a third party no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, that being an extreme circumstance there. But, I mean, you know, I, I think the helmets, if they don't have that taper on the gray area on the back, it might be for a reason, whether or not they're just trying to save space. You know, maybe there's not a thick, you know, like, there's not a void in the plastic for that channel behind there. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one. So one thing uh, I did talk to Lucas monster today was telling me that, you know, the same thing, like I, he, you know, I don't, I think the helmet looks too big, blah, blah, blah. And so I was saying as somebody who like um, has been around like 501st approved clone trooper armor and like making my own, it's, yeah. it, it's so impossible. You could never meet the body proportions of either an animated clone trooper or a, cg clone trooper from the prequels right. um it, it's impossible and especially with the helmets uh the clone trooper helmets in the prequels have that lip on the bottom that touches the neck mm -hmm. um and it goes all the way around so there's no way a clone trooper would be able to take his helmet off in those movies with those proportions so what the 501st did in the beginning was they literally you had a magnet that took off the whole face plate of the helmet right you had to put on the back of the helmet and then use the magnets to attach the front of the helmet so that you could have an accurate look. Nowadays, the 501st has done away with that. And now you can have helmets that don't have the lip at all. And that's one of the things that Hasbro doesn't have on their helmet either. So, mm -hmm. and, and again, even then, like I have a pretty big nose. Um, and so, you know, trying to fit in one of those clone trooper helmets, you, my nose is touching the visor. Like it just right. it's smashed up against the visor. It's not a comfortable fit. Um, and then you think about those people who have very large domes. And, you know, I think what Hasbro was trying to achieve with this was creating the most accurate looking helmet that at an fit, affordable price. And that could fit the most amount of people. Yes. And it's like a one, it has to be a one size fits all. That's why they have the right. adjustable doohickey on the inside, mm -hmm. you know. And so I think that with this particular product, that's where, you know, I'm nitpicking. I am like mm -hmm. 100 percent because as someone who is like getting trained to look for inaccuracies for something that needs to be approved by the 501st. That's the things that I'm looking for. And that's where my eyes go first. What's right. wrong with it. But again, it's like the same as a black series figure, just because there are small inaccuracies with it, or I don't like the way something looks from an image. I never trust Hasbro's images to tell me how a figure looks because especially with like photo reel and stuff like that, you know, the Darth Vader helmet for Obi-Wan Kenobi looked ridiculous. And then I saw it, you know, because it was at that camera angle where the helmet is leaned back. And then I saw people get it in hand and it looks fantastic. Right. Um, so I, it's not going to stop me from I'm going to pre-order it. I'm going to buy it. Um, it's not going to stop me. But then I get the opportunity to do a review on it. You know, I get the opportunity right. to actually look at the product. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm at with it. Yeah. 
No, it's a good looking helmet. I mean, even, you know, I've had a lot of issues with the Black Series helmets of just not fitting. Yeah. Um, I remember the Rogue One helmet. I, I, I excitedly found it at Walmart, like very much at time of release within a few days. And I got out in my car with it. And I didn't even go home. I opened it in the car and I widened the headband as far as the headband would go because I have a big head and I know. And then I set it on my head like a baseball cap and it wouldn't go any further down than here. And I'm like, the expandability on this is garbage. Like, it, it, yeah, it's just not, you know, feasible, you know. And like, I remember I forced it down where I had my eyes about where the mouth was. And that was like all I could do, even like uncomfortably. <laughs> so that became a shelf queen. But yeah. And that's the other part of it is like, you're, I'm gonna be honest with you. So I have worn both my Boba Fett helmet and my Mandalorian helmet driving on mm -hmm. many occasions. And the Mandalorian helmets have a very nice viewport for, what? for driving, I think definitely. But Stormtrooper helmets and clone trooper helmets have awful, awful viewports when you're trying to drive with that sucker right. on. And especially because with the phase two helmets, it's got, it, it curves up. So you have right where your eyes are is where right. the least Nothing amount here. of viewing oh, space is. Yes. Yeah. So my eyes are literally like right here. So like I have like decent peripheral like out to here, but like, And the helmets in the back. Is it black? All here. I don't know if I, can you hear me? Is yeah, I, I started to come back. All right, so it tapers into a V. So you have like a really just kind of like a right. visor field of view, and then this T part allows you to see like where your feet are. So you have like a really like decent yeah. viewing experience in a Mandalorian helmet, and then you put this on, and you're like, I cannot see. I am legally blind. That's another reason why I I think I I mess with Phase One helmets a little bit more. And that's still probably my hottest take is everybody's like, oh, phase two is the best. No, I think phase one's better. I love phase one. I I'm with you there. I mean, phase two is great, but like phase one, honestly, is where I'm at. And that's what I'm like. That's my dream for like this new Hasbro kind of Clone Wars thing for next year is I want a phase one Rex so bad. That's that's what I want. That's what I need. All you have to do is like repaint that like that arc trooper that came with the Tarkovsky wave because he's got the antenna on him. I'm like, points. please. Yes. Just repaint that Joe. Right. Um, no, that's that's what I want. That's that's the thing I want the most out of uh, the stuff next year. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm with you. Phase one Rex would be good. Um, honestly, I could talk to you all day long about my Clone Wars wish list. I mean, there. Uh, th there, there hasn't been a big focus on it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's kind of like exciting. It's going to be exciting, but also underwhelming because like we've been waiting like 10 years of the Black Series for them to finally say, hey, let's focus on Clone Wars for a bit. And we're going to get it for one year. And, you know, I mean, in a standard year, not talking exclusives, we get what, like four waves. So like even if they did four waves of nothing but Clone Wars, they said the hell of Andor and, you know, everything else, we're just going to do Clone Wars stuff. It won't be enough. My, my wish list is too long. Mm -hmm. what is your top 10 on your wish list though like if you could get like 10 figures out of this wave and then you would be happy what would it be savage press um not to be a luke ness but fives i think we need fives <laughs> um he's on to something there um i think we need some phase one commanders primarily rex and cody um with that i would also want phase one you know 501st and 212th to go with uh, I, we would want at least the two common outfits for Ahsoka, the movie outfit and the season three to five outfit. Um, and then I would want mid Clone Wars outfits for Anakin and Obi-Wan where they lost most of the armor, but they weren't in the Revenge of the Sith gear yet. Mm -hmm. um, that's gotta be what, at least 10, something like that. Yeah, and that's 10 exactly right, actually. Right. Pre Vizsla. And that's like essential. Um, yeah. I would lean towards a later pre Vizsla where he like had the antennas on the helmet and that's what I would want. Yeah. Season four, you know I mean? If they did like a season two previous, like it'd be cool, but like we only saw him in that for one episode. And then like he had the later outfit for the rest of the run. Um, so yeah, I like, I think previous is a, a must get maybe a season three Ventress because that's more of a Tarkovsky, like inspired outfit, you know, even if mm -hmm. they just the Tarkovsky, you know, Ventress, you know, on that retro card for that, it'd be all right. It would work as filler. 
So yeah, I, I think for me, it's exciting that they're doing it at all. So what I've learned from Hasbro is that they're really just that what they make is determined by Lucasfilm. Right. With, with Star Wars figures. And they're they don't have really any say. Everything that they do has to get approved by Lucasfilm. Mm -hmm. So for them to be able to do figures that aren't just from season seven of the Clone Wars, which is the only to Disney, the only relevant Clone Wars right now. Right. You know, this is a good opportunity. They could do 100% reuse all only clone troopers, battle droids, whatever. And I would be cool with it because that's all I want is just more right. clone wars characters to flesh out the shelf. Now, if I had to pick one figure for them to do completely new, it would be dirge. I would want them to do a dirge figure true to the character. Hasbro has done realistic interpretations of him in the past. I had as a kid, a three and three quarter inch scale he was dirge. He had his jet pack. Uh, he had more human body proportions um, than right. he does in the animated show. Um, he was just like a, like a seven foot tall human, basically. Right. Uh, he had blaster pistols that went in his holsters and he came with his green swoop bike with the big skull on the front, just like he has in the show. And that was one of my favorite toys to play with as a kid. And I would just love to see them do, they don't have to do the speeder bike. They don't have to do anything. Just give me a dirge figure with just the blaster pistols. Right. And I will be a happy camper. That's a must get if they focus. And, and I thought they'd said it's going to be a pretty mixed batch of like Tarkovsky and 08. Yeah. Like I think for the Tarkovsky stuff, like that is a must do, you know, for, mm -hmm. I mean, cause like from what we got, you know, we got the Grievous and the Mace and the Arc Trooper, like, I don't know what else really I'd want from that series other than dirge and maybe like the shirtless tattooed Anakin. Like there's not really a whole lot more from the show that isn't so close to other movie outfits that I think I would like have to have it. So yeah, I think dirge and probably that Anakin would do for that show. Okay. Could you repeat the last part there? Cause I think everything cut out for a second. If you yeah, could repeat it was, it was a little buggy. shirtless Anakin and the, what else? Uh, like a shirtless Anakin and Dirge, I think would be yeah. a enough to wrap up that show in Black Series for me. If they did other stuff, it'd be cool. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, we have our armored Obi Wan from a few years back, the Walgreens mm. exclusive. They um, should just re release that. They should. They should, they should just throw it on the retro card, maybe update it to the new clone body. But even if they just straight reissued, it'd be okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, at that point, if they did Dirge and the shirtless Anakin, we'd have like six figures from this micro series, you know, and it's like the the big ones, you know. Mm -hmm. We got to get Jedi Shaggy. We got to get him. Right. Uh, Shaggy. Shaggy. Right. Yeah, that's a money. Yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, for this, it's like uh, all I want is for them to do just retro cards for the black series figures right. you know i would prefer for them not to just put it in the galaxy packs you know mm -hmm. i'd prefer just to do retro cards because then right. i would want to get two of each instead of just getting one of each mm -hmm. um and one other thing this is my theory so if this happens next year everybody owes me twenty dollars so my theory is oh i don't <laughs> my theory is that hasbro is going to announce a has lab to go with this, this kind of mini beat that they keep talking about. Now the vintage collection has not had the opportunity for a has lab since the razor crest. It's mm -hmm. been a few years since then the black series has had two opportunities for a has lab. Both have failed. So what I'm thinking, what I'm assuming, what I'm hoping is that there would be either a lat gunship has lab or an ATTE has lab because I'm looking at both of them around the room here. Hasbro has not done an ATTE since the clone wars right around mm -hmm. 2009, 2010. And yes, it's an animated style. Jacob's going to grab it right now. It's an animated style, but it could definitely pass as a realistic ATTE. Sure. And they definitely just got to dig out the mold for this. Right. So I had this as a kid. Um, I did too. This opens up in the front. You have four seats on the front. You got four seats in the front. You got the the ass opens up. And then it like folds out all slow. Got room for like 12 clone troopers in there with weapon mm. storage and everything. And then this had like firing missiles on top. These little 
uh, guns in the front swiveled. All the legs were movable. There's buttons here, so it would make sounds. I don't think there's batteries in it. Let me see if there's an on switch on the underbelly of this. No. Nope. So, um, man, yeah, it so spanked it. Yeah, this would this would be like an easy thing for them to do just because I know that they have the mold for this and this would be something that people like. And then same thing for the light gunship. Like that's something that people would buy. But um I won't because I have the UCS Lego set and it's probably gonna be about the same size. Right. Yeah, and for me, it, and again, it's like I think it would make sense to do vintage collection because you can get that larger vehicle. Right. And they just released a four pack uh, army builder pack of phase one clone troopers, you it's know, good. so it would make sense. And honestly, you know, I, I think that the ATT was between a hundred and $150 back in the day. Mm -hmm. I want to say it was like Before one inflation. Yeah. I want to say it was like right. one twenty maybe so today's now, standards. That's today probably That's probably like, like $7 billion. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. A lot but of I think honestly, like even if they retooled it, you know, you could think about stretch goals. Like, I know in the Clone Wars, you each know, leg is a stretch goal. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the body. You have to get it funded all the way so it can actually stand. And it's 72,000 backers. Uh, <laughs> it's 72,000 backers. Right. The base cost, $7,000. Um, yeah, I mean, it. you know, in the Clone Wars Season 1, you have ATRTs that come out of the back of the ATTEs. And, you know, there's tons of different stuff they could do sure. to make this a 300 350 dollar product you know if they wanted to completely retool it or like with a lat gunship there's tons of different ways they could customize it and add different accessories and stuff to if they feel like bringing the cost up or you know for stretch goals even you know give it the laser pods on the side with the interchangeable like the big flashlight pods from the clone wars you know right. cool give it the different sliding doors one for attack of the clones one for the clone wars you know it's there's give it like different, give it a sticker sheet. You could give it different nose art and stuff like that. Make it look like the Tartakovsky gunship, make it look like another gunship. It's there's endless possibilities. And I think honestly, it's a very real possibility. You want to know what would be a really cool HasLab idea hmm. is if Hasbro did HasLab helmets, but they weren't like had any play features or anything like that. These were helmets that were made from the same molds that the actual movie props were made from. And they were like, 100% accurate to the screen stuff. $7,000. Take well, it. You, know, you look at like the, what, the Denuo Novo? Yeah, you know? the Duo Novo helmets. If they did something like that. Right, because I mean like those, you know, I mean, they're they're mass produced, but in limited runs, aren't they? Yeah. So like, you know, I mean, a, a typical one of those runs like what, five, six, seven hundred dollars, if not more, depending on how big it is. You know, that Royal Guard helmet I know got really big, so it was more expensive. You know, I mean, I, I imagine Hasbro could probably get the cost down on something like that to be more accurate than your typical Black Series helmet at like a three hundred dollar price point, a nice middle ground. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I could see that. I mean, that'd be a good go to. I, I'm still. I, I have faith that we'll get a Black Series Haslab through someday. I I, I, don't. I, I, I mean it. I, I get where they're at on like the X wing is too big, and a yeah. lot of vehicles are too big. I think they, they need to go for a smaller scale vehicle. I know everyone's been saying you know the Jedi Starfighters. Um, you know, I mean that would be solid. I think that would be about maxed out vehicle size. You know, because you're still talking like 250 at that point. And I would buy it. Yeah, and I mean, I'd be completely here for it. Um, one it thing would come down to the wire, and there'd be like they need 100 more backers, and there's like 30 seconds left, and I would buy 100 of them. <laughs> one thing that always, you know, throws me off is they want to do it. They push it with vintage collection all the time, but they've never tried it truly like they have with vintage for black series is like their diorama pieces. You know, they've done the, I mean, you know, we got that one little section of a bar in the black series packaging, you know, but you know, we've gotten tan of four hallways and, you know, a Mandalorian cantinas and I mean, Jabba's palace, the whole throne room, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I think, you know how like uh, they talk about it every now and then they're kind of heard about it now that uh, Nate and Justin out of the basement, how they backed that third party Tana four hallway and then the company disappeared, you know, it was kind of, yep. you know, shady stuff. But I think that people are talking about that kind of implies that there would be a market for it. I, I think like a Tana four hallway would be a good Haslab idea. Yeah. For a I thought there was a Hasbro one that they did. 
For vintage collection. For vintage collection. Three and three quarter. I thought there was one. No, he's talking about black series. Oh, uh, okay. so what, that same thing and blew it up bigger, you know. Well, and what yeah. gets me about about the Haslabs is we're in it. We're in a state right now where people get so stuck on what the stretch goals are mm-hmm. that they will make their decision on whether or not to back the Haslab at all based on whether they like the extra things you might get if enough people back it. I think that if that your decision on backing it should be based on whether you feel the value of the product itself is worth the price or not. Correct. Because to me, an extra $20 action figure that would come with this thing that I'm already paying $350 for is just a bonus. It shouldn't be, well, I'm deciding to unback this. And obviously I'm referencing the Rancor here. I'm not, you know, it shouldn't be, I'm unbacking this project because a $20 action figure that I was hoping would be a part of this didn't end up being a part of this project. And I think that going forward, Hasbro is going to be very, very cautious. I mean, you would think that a Rancor would would back and would make it for the Black Series. It's original trilogy. By the right. time it came out, it would have been right around, you know, right now where the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi is coming. Mm-hmm. And it, everything would have lined up. And, and it literally came down to a bunch of neckbeards online with a movement, no Ula, no Mula. Mm-hmm. That's what it came down to. It was about a $20 action figure that was never going to be included. Right. And they convinced themselves that that was the make or break to spend $350. Granted, if people wanted it that bad, it's not like it's out of the realm of what Hasbro can do. It's really just like what Lucasfilm is willing to do because this is one of the stretch goals in the new Ghost Rider thing. This is a figure. Right. Yeah. The, 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 what, the Queen of Hell or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's a scantily clad woman. So it's not like, it's not like Hasbro didn't have the ability to do it. I think it was just a thing with ha- with the licensing with uh, Lucasfilm that they didn't want. That's one hundred percent what it was. That's why, like I just said, like everything Hasbro does with Star Wars has to be approved by Lucasfilm, mm-hmm. and they were not down to do Ula, which is the same reason that we're not seeing a new Slave Leia figure mm-hmm. for the Hasbro for for the Return of the Jedi fortieth. It's the same exact reason. Right. Mm-hmm. I th- that's one figure though. I do think is kind of like you really should be doing that figure. Not because I'm like, Oh, I'm horny for Leia, (laughs) but because I'm like, it it is such an an iconic scene from the movie. It's an iconic look for Leia because everybody that's in their fifties right now realized that that's when they became a man in the theater. Um, (laughs) And to be honest, they changed it from slave Leia to hut slayer. So if anything, it's glorifying what she's wearing and what she does in the scene that she's wearing right. it. So why wouldn't you want to produce it with the with if you if Disney, the people that produce Star Wars, can have Megan the Stallion and She Hulk twerk? I think you can say that Leia wearing that clothes is sexually liberating as well. So I I, I just don't get Disney's logic. I think it's if it because is it like Lucasfilm's department that works with Disney? Is it Lucasfilm like separate from Disney? Is I think it it's a Lucasfilm sh- thing, if is, I'm being honest but with it, you. But Disney owns Lucasfilm. So is it like Disney's telling Lucasfilm to do right. it? Or is it mm-hmm. Lucasfilm making the decision on their own? I don't know. Because it's the same thing with you can't have open limbs in the boxes for uh, Star Wars figures as well. Like when you think when the Emperor had a different head that was hidden behind the piece of cardboard, that you can't have like extra hands just kind of poking out in packaging because Lucasfilm doesn't like it. Well, the Ala Sakura figure is going to have open limbs. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't make sense though as to why you would like not have it more often due to the fact that we see people's get heads get cut off, people get cut in half, their hands right, get cut off right. all the time. Right. And we see their stumps be like, oh! Like, like why is this a thing with the toys that like separate it, it doesn't and make sense i wouldn't even doesn't. call them toys anymore they're co- right. they're literally called collectibles now mm-hmm. it's it's because somebody in my classroom calls them dolls and it makes me want to shoot myself <laughs> <laughs> it's like in the way i look at it it's like we're in a we're in a stage right now where i have a 12 year old brother he does right. not play with with action figures or right. you know bakugan or beyblades or trading cards he plays video games kids mm-hmm. nowadays play video games and it's the market for collectibles is people 
people in their 20s, people who have adult money, who just got adult money because 10 years ago when they were growing up, all that was out was action figures. Mm -hmm. Right. Video games were a thing, but action figures were very essential to any any anybody's childhood. Mm -hmm. sure. So I think that that is if you're targeting that market. You know, mm -hmm. why why are we playing the, with the rules like it's like it's a thing for children? Mm -hmm. I don't know about y'all, you guys, but um. When I, cause I eventually in my life, I want to have a family. Um, I'm kind of in the realm of, I don't want my kids to have like video games or like smartphones or anything like that until they're hitting middle school. You're going to be that parent. Well, not oh, because parent. that I think, cause my parents didn't do that to me. And I honestly, I think it was a good thing because I loved that phase of my life where I played with action figures. I went outside and when I did play video games, it was at a friend's house and it was like a something special. I was in like, right. cause the second I hit middle school and I had video games, all I did, I never went outside. I was always inside. I was always playing video games. Like I had like no social life other than like being on the game. And I see so many kids like nowadays that like, like, especially the iPad kids in public, they're just right. like, <laughs> like, I, I don't want to sit at the table at the restaurant without the tablet blasting family guy, funny moments. Like, and I also, <laughs> I also think that's one of those things. Cause I, Right now, I find myself in an art major, and you have to be relatively a creative person to do that type of stuff, especially with different art projects every single week. So I think that is also something that kind of progressed my creativity because that's something that you lose as you get older. It's not something that you can like really retain. So he has a cat. She was pestering me. This is Ahsoka, by the way. Oh, oh that's awesome. Uh, kill it. <laughs> <laughs> um, she keeps pestering me. Mm. but no i i don't know what you guys think about that idea like how do you think you're going to give your kids video games ipads and tablets like when they're young or I, do you want them to have like that that age range where they are playing with toys? my i mean my parents always just gave me like a limit you just had a limit on these yeah. like like i wasn't you didn't play video games on school nights and mm -hmm. then on nights where you didn't have school the next day i had an allotted amount of time that i could choose throughout the day when i wanted to use um, I, I could, you know, I had like two hours or three hours where I could play video games, but after that, no more screen time, you know? And so I, I did, I still have the opportunity to play with, with, and again, it was like Bakugan and then it was, you know, Pokemon cards mm -hmm. and then magic, the gathering I did with my friends in like fifth grade. And then you Beyblade. Know, Beyblade was right. a big one. And again, like Star Wars action figures were just always there. Mm -hmm. That right. was a, specifically Star Wars. I had like a couple Avatar figures. I had a couple, you know, like GI Joes and a couple Lord of the Rings figures. I had some Indiana Jones figures. I have a really funny story about getting those figures too. Cause I was in fourth and fifth grade. I was super, super, super in Indiana Jones. I was that cringe kid. I wore a fedora because, uh, Indy Ooh. Wore one. <laughs> but I actually have it in the other room, but, um, it wasn't like the trilby. It was like, I, I just wore it because Indiana Jones wore it. Right. But, um, I remember one time my dad found like this pack. It was like 12 figures from like all the different movies, like online that some guy was selling. And um, I remember one night, my because my dad told me that he was going to buy them. I was super excited. And then one night he pulls me into the room and goes, hey, I just got an email from the seller. So it was like the dude's parole officer or friend emailing us saying that the guy got arrested and was in jail but the person was going to take over sending us the figures because they couldn't figure out how to give us our money back so oh my goodness uh, i remember my dad being like so the guy's in jail i'm like i'm not gonna get my figures and he was like no i have a story about uh a mail away figure oh so, i love that right. So, I wish you would do those more. I mean, or any more. Like they were. Well, awesome. that was back when you could find action figures in stores. Right. I, I think. I think that's a, a your guys' area. We we can go to that next. But yeah. So I uh, back when I was like, mm, it must have been like 2010, 2011, when Clone Wars was doing the packaging where every figure came with like the dice and the trading card mm -hmm. with the battle card. Mm -hmm. So there was a you there was a mail away figure for Sergeant Brick, the brain head dude from the Camino, the Camino arc, right? And it came in that big weird square package. It wasn't like the regular Clone Wars packaging. It came with that yeah, battle yeah. mat, like uh it was for like that card game. It was like the battle mat thing, but it also doubled yeah. as a carrying case. Yes, exactly. 
So I had the carrying case too, come to think of it, but right. it was like a softy material, you know? Right. It was like, um, kind of like a vinyl sort of. Yeah. And so uh, there's Sergeant Brick was mm -hmm. the mail away figure. And I was like, my heart was set on getting that figure and I, and this is why I've always like, as much as I will like dog on Hasbro and stuff, I've always had a very strong opinion that they are different from other toy companies and that they are deserving of the star Wars license and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was young, my, of course my parents were helping me, you know, we'd go to the store, find this figure and that figure because you needed so many to like, get the the stuff for your sergeant brick right it was like five or six like the barcodes you had to get yeah mail. so i got them all together and we mailed the sergeant brick we sent in an envelope to hasbro's like the address for hasbro's headquarters or whatever it was mm -hmm. and a few days after we mailed it my dad came up to me and said hey we forgot to put like i don't remember if it was the barcodes or the paper that said that you were going for the brick and I, I remember I just sobbed. I was so upset because right. I was like, I worked so hard for this. I, you know, for months and months, we looked for the figures and got the figures together. And I was so excited and it just didn't happen. And it was like the, it was like very close to the deadline when we finally mailed it out too. So like, I was like, this right. is like, I was sobbing, sobbing. Well, then a week later I got um, a letter in the mail from Hasbro and it was, they had, they had sent me a, like a letter, a personalized letter for me saying that they got my stuff, but they realized that I forgot to put this one paper in the envelope. So if I just send them the one paper with the letter they sent me back to them, they would fulfill my Sergeant Brick. And they said they had one like on on standby for me. And I had like a month to like get back to them or whatever. So I sent the, I sent the paper back and sure enough, I got the Sergeant Brick in the mail like a couple weeks later. And it was like, because of that, I will, that's something I'll always remember. I'll always remember being sad about it. And then I'll always remember that I got the figure and how much of a special moment that was mm -hmm. oh, to yeah. like get that special white box from Hasbro and to dig it, you know, open it up and dig out the figure. Mm -hmm. And I still have them, you know, this is the one uh, mail away figure that I got. It was a proto Boba. I also had that, that, that vintage collection one. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. the one where the stomach gets removed or that's a different one? That's a different one. Yeah. But I remember I, we got this and I was super excited about it. And it was like, I thought it was the coolest figure of all time. And then my dad said, that's really cool. I don't want anything to happen to that one. And he went and put it in the gun safe. He <laughs> <laughs> was like, I don't want anything to happen to this one. But then eventually he, I, he let me take it out and play with it. But right. um, yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely adore. This was like my favorite, like star Wars figure growing up for a little bit, aside from like the um, ARF trooper figure I have. Yeah. That's dope. Mm-hmm. One time, my dad, like, um, he had all of, like, the original Kenner figures from, like, when he was growing up. But he sold all of them for books in college. Yeah. For book money. And then he only kept one, and it was the TIE Fighter pilot. Ooh. And he let me and my brother play with it sometimes. And I remember one time, I left it out of the carrying case on the middle of the oh, floor. No. And my, my old dog, Moonshine, came in, and she ate it. <laughs> she just, oh, ah, no. ripped it apart. So, um, oh. and I've always, and I always felt bad about it ever since that day, but now he has a, he has one in there, the shadow box yeah. in, in the shadow box. So uh, it's a good looking display. I like that shadow box y'all did for him. Yeah, it was. Um, How do you know about that? They showed me. When, you, when were you in this house? Oh yeah. yeah. No, never, never, ever. Right. You mean you got a tour of the 1313 set? Yeah. Jackson must've done it. Uh, see, that's what happens when you <laughs> look at the cat. Look at the cat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She likes the attention. She knows she's being looked at. Mm -hmm. What do you want? Pat that's uh, that's what happens when um you come to the the comic con is you get to come check out the thirteen thirteen set. Maybe, right? Maybe, yeah. Maybe. If, we, if you're not stinky. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, you were gonna say something about finding figures in the area. Yeah, I, I mean, just sort of as like a conversation topic type thing. Like, okay. I. This this last like year and a half or two have kind of completely, with very rare exception, quit pre-ordering anything. Wow. Um, with the, like the only exception is Amazon exclusives. Yeah. Um, like 
if you pre-order a Target exclusive, it doesn't matter what it is, it's going to get canceled on you yep. at 3 a.m. someday. Mm -hmm. And if you pre-order a Walmart exclusive, it's going to go up for sale on Walmart.com for months before they ever decide to fulfill your pre-order. If they do and, it all. Right. And if you pre-order at GameStop, you know, their website's been all right. I used to do the in-store pre-orders a lot, but now they'll ship out every online pre-order before they'll touch an in-store pre-order. Yep. And I'm at a point where I just don't do it anymore because honestly, I would pre-order cases at Entertainment Earth and Big Bad. And then I would find it at Walmart months before anyone got fulfillment from there. And mm -hmm. like, I mean, I've never had an issue with the in the store hunting, but I also mm -hmm. go like hardcore on it. Like I'll see where Yak Face will post, you know, hey, uh, someone found this wave at a Target and I'll wait until I see a found sighting for like somewhere within 300 miles of us. And then because that just means it's in our region. Oh, OK, OK. I was like, damn, I'm not going that far, you know, but like, I mean, if, you know, I mean, like I, I'm, you know, in like Northeast Ohio and if it turns up in Indiana or Pennsylvania or Virginia or Kentucky or something, it's probably somewhere in Ohio. So like, honestly, I, I have this big loop I drive where I drive like almost like I, I'm when I say Northeast Ohio, I'm saying like 10 miles from Lake Erie, 10 miles from Pennsylvania. I am in the corner. So like, I'll go from there all the way to Cleveland about as south as Akron and then back over to Youngstown and then back up to where I'm at. And wow. it's like, if I do the full circle, it's like 150 miles of driving. But usually by the time that I get to Cleveland, I've hit like six targets. Right. And usually I've started to find, you know, like uh, I haven't, I haven't gone hunting yet for the Ayla and mall wave. There hasn't been any local sightings. It's starting to show up. It's starting to. Right. I actually well, found one in the dumpster at GameStop. Oh, no. <laughs> right. But like, I, I mean, like a, a wave like that, like usually, you know, yeah, the Ayla and the mall are always going to be the first ones to go from that. But mm -hmm. if I went hunting, usually by the time I get to Cleveland, I'd have found the Grogu or the Grief Karga of the wave. Right. Like yeah. The figures that are going to get left behind. And then that means, hey, yeah, it is somewhere here. Um, Meadville, Pennsylvania, I found the General Lando wave like two months before it started hitting anywhere else. Just when some of those random Walmart sightings started showing up. So like, right. I, mean, I don't really deal with pre-orders anymore. You know, it's. Yeah, yeah, I, I really stopped with the Walmart and Target ones. I really just go to Return of the Nerd from Taiwan. And right. I'll just get like four figures at a time from him. And it, it would come out to the same price as, with the international. You know, it comes out to the same price as buying four figures from Walmart or Target online anyway. Right. Pre-order. So, you know, I, I just wait, get a group of four of them from him and get them over here in the States. And uh, it just makes it so much of it. Like I already have all the and or Walmart and Target exclusives mm -hmm. and I don't have to worry about it. Right. But again, it's like the, the distribution is starting to get better again though. Like I'm starting to right. see figures in stores more often than I mm -hmm. did when I started collecting because before it was always a ghost town anywhere you went. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm mean, going to like a Target now. And I mean, like you're going to find that uh, snowy Mando Mato Crace pack. And you're going to see on clearance, but some Antox and some Galen's and mm -hmm. you're probably going to see a bunch of Tika's. And I mean, like, even if it's just that limited selection at all of them, there was a time a year ago where you go to target and there would be like one lonely, like quill on the shelf. Yeah. But now mm -hmm. you know, there's like 20 figures and there's like five or six, you know, different characters of yeah. that assortment. And like, there's not like a, there's not a shortage. If you wake up in the morning and say, Hey, today, I don't care who it is. I'm going to buy a star Wars figure. And you go to your store, there's going to be an option for you. There's going to be a few to pick from. So like, and I, I just, I don't know. I start seeing found reports and I just go for it. You know? Yeah. It's also like the most exhilarating feeling to find figures in store. I know Jacob always has a good story yeah. about the three thirty second Walmart exclusive. I, um, I was at Walmart. And I was coming home from something. I don't remember what. And uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to check Walmart just because I know they're not going to have it. But I might as well check. And this is when they right. had them on like that end cap. And mm -hmm. um, I turned the corner and there's like a good maybe 50 yards to go. So you get to like the toy section of this uh, of this Walmart. And I could just see the end cap and I could see the figures on it. And I was like, oh, and there's this guy speed walking to towards the toy section. I was like, this dude's going to try to get him first. So I went in the opposite lane and I was like. <laughs> going from as hard as i could i literally i slid into the into the end cap and i scooped them all up 
come to find out this dude was going for hot toys like a lo- not hot toys hot wheels like a loser so um <laughs> yeah t- turns of the hot wheels i grab all my my plastic dolls because i'm a cool guy and i call everybody i know i'm like i found the whole of them do you need them and i ended up <laughs> having like two uh three thirty second figures that all are right. like over there right now yeah it was that that was a real i think there's only like one that they didn't have and it was like the um the one of the Mandos, it was the yeah. Maldalorian that they didn't have, but they had like one Ahsoka, two troopers, and the uh, Mandalorian like loyalists. And I was like, and I was happy, a happy camper checking them all out. And my mom was with me, and she's like, "Do you actually need all of those? Like, do you need all those?" And I was like, mm-hmm. "Right, mm-hmm. every last one of them. I need them." So. I remember, and that was a crazy weekend when those dropped. Yeah, like mm-hmm. it. I was on a second date with someone when I saw the when I saw the yak face post that you know <laughs> hey people are finding these at Walmart and I was like do I ruin this yeah I ruin this and I asked like Can we go to no Walmart? no and no but she was cool with it she okay. was actually cool that she like yeah but I hadn't shared that this was my thing and I was like hey and I, mean, I tried to be all nonchalant I was like hey uh, let's go to Walmart after this and she's like oh, oh why and I'm like uh stuff <laughs> was there a had, date? they had the ahsoka and the two different mandalorians but the 330 seconds were gone and there was ah. a third date she thought it was cute so oh, sweet. so mm-hmm. you know we broke up since for other reasons like my unlikable personality but <laughs> <laughs> she thought it was cute until she saw my living room and all 600 of them <laughs> staring at us <laughs> she said oh this is nice and they all said Right. It's always been like the most like like not not even like I wouldn't even say humiliating. It's just I already know how she's gonna react if I right. if I'm like go on a date with someone. It was always the funniest like back at when I was living in my apartment um at school. Like I would have a girl over and we would just be like talking and like hanging out in the living room or like we'd like go get a pizza or something, hang out in the kitchen. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go, like, you know, change or something. She'd be like, oh, can I see your room? And I'd always go, you don't want to. And like, oh, is it a mess? And I'm like, oh, it's definitely not a mess. Like, it's very organized, but you're just not, not going to like when you see. And uh, there's been a couple of times, like, where I would just, like, walk in to, like, put a hoodie on or something. And I turn around and she's just, like, there. the girl will just be in the doorway just looking around. And I'm like, yeah, so I'll uh, see you never. I'm just <laughs> I, I have gotten lucky in that and that i've never found anyone that thought it was a bad thing oh that's good um, yeah. yeah i mean usually I, I don't know i mean i maybe it's just luck I, I try not to go for like the super like picky snobby type you know like you usually like, find one like, like, <laughs> usually have, like i mean I, I try to find someone that has their own hobbies so yes. like, it's like as a life yeah, right yeah, you yeah, know yeah. So at least there's an understanding like hey you know you uh you know, you collect records and I collect Star Wars figures and they're different things, but you understand, you know, mm-hmm. the, you understand the the thought process and mm-hmm. then we'll go to Walmart together and we'll go to separate aisles and find what we want. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I mean, it's always worked out well, but uh, that weekend was like ridiculous because well, not only did I find the Clone Wars wave, but that was when the uh, Endor, Han, Luke, Leia, Cad oh, Bane wave yeah. was dropping. And I was looking for Clone Wars figures and that wave was there too. So I walked out with like 12 figures. <laughs> like I have like 10 of them here and she's carrying the two that I couldn't carry. But I was like, can you grab those? And she's like, uh, yeah, like, mm-hmm. I still got another date. So that was great. Mm-hmm. But then I spent I, um, that weekend like hunting the 332nd. Mm-hmm. And that was that was like the most stressful two days of collecting ever. Because I knew if I missed them, I'd never get them. Yeah, mm-hmm. 100%. And, and I spent, cause that was a Friday night date and I knew I had to work on Monday. So I had like Saturday and Sunday to hit every Walmart in the Midwest to eventually find three thirty second. And I went to this one near me and I, they didn't have them out, but I saw the pallets out there. So I'm looking for Hasbro shipping boxes and they were not in standard Hasbro shipping boxes. And I saw what the boxes looked like later. And I walked by them so many times uh... as I went to this Walmart. And then finally, my local most Walmart, I just went and they finally had the end cap up and they Sweet. had like three of them on the shelf. And I was like, great, that's that's it. Awesome. Nice. But like that was that was like the most intense 
weekend. And then the Clone Wars target wave dropped and I just watched target.com for like, that was the most intense for me was, was going to the, cause these guys were on vacation for that week. So it was up to me to find a set for myself and at least one set for their big collection. So I, I went to target every day. I got there an hour before they opened every day, five days in a row. I was so sleep deprived. Right. And it was just, I didn't care. And eventually I got all of them. Um, at least one set for you guys and one set for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was it was a blast. But I know you had a story. Oh, I was just going to say that um, I find myself really lucky when it comes to um, the girlfriend situation. Oh, yeah, you have one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But because our relationship kind of started because we were watching Star Wars and movies together. That was kind of like our hanging out thing. I remember that. And now because um, she's in school in Florida. Uh, whenever she goes to like the mall there, they have a Lego store. She always like calls me. She's like, is there anything that you want while I'm here? Or like, she'll go to like Target and Walmart and like call me and like be like, they have this, this, and this. Do you need anything? Do you want anything? Like get yourself a girl that figure hunts for you. Like get it right. Tommy, I know that's going to be really hard for you due to the fact that you have trouble talking to a woman in general. I don't know what you're um, talking about, dude. (laughs) Yeah, that's so wholesome. I'm taking my toaster to my bath tonight. That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Make sure it's plugged in first. Well, time right. to listen to Nirvana and brood in the dark while I drive home tonight. You time know? to listen to uh, Nirvana and plan about being just like my idol, Kurt Cobain. <laughs> oh okay. right. I'm in an old house with no GFCI in the bathroom, so there's no stopping me. <laughs> uh, Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. We're back. Okay. We and go. on that, thank you guys so much for watching this episode of the Thirteen Thirteen Podcast. Real quick um, before we close thank out, thank you for. I'm gonna do this since you're technologically inept. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for Hybrid Toy Reviews for coming on this episode of Have a Chat. If you haven't already, make sure that you are subscribed to Hybrid Toy Reviews. He definitely copied my logo. I don't. I don't even know what you guys are talking about. But uh, make sure that you subscribe and press that bell icon so that way you know when he uploads. Um, he does awesome figure reviews all the time, and he has more subs than us, so I'm totally not jealous. But uh, right. make sure that you go and subscribe to his channel. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, Hybrid Toy Reviews on YouTube. Um, make sure that you are subscribed to him. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But, yes, with that being said, everybody, thank you, Hybrid, for joining us. On Thanks, right? our first have a chat back mm-hmm. to the reboot mm-hmm. of the series. Dude, we forgot the lightning round. He's already done it. He's already done it. He did it at the at the Comic Con. That's yeah. right. Make so... sure that you go check out that hot mic video if you want to hear his lightning round of questions. Yes. But thank you guys so much for watching this episode of the 13th of the New Podcast. If you haven't already, please make sure that you are subscribed, leave a comment, leave a like, and follow us on all of our social medias that are located down below. That is Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And if you haven't already, make sure that you join our Discord because we have tons of awesome conversations with tons of awesome people in our Discord all the time. And if you want to go above and beyond to support the podcast, make sure that you support us on Patreon. We do tons of giveaways every single month for our Gungan Boss tier on Patreon, and we're going to keep the latest uh, giveaway a surprise until further notice. But thank you guys so much for watching this episode of the 13th of the New Podcast. We'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody!